But you guys can hear me out there even without the mic, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but there's a whole world out there that didn't hear nothing. They, they started getting emails. I can't hear him. I can't hear him. I can't hear him. All right, glad to have you guys out again. We're in Revelation chapter 19. We're going to get at it. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through verse 9, and then we're going to pick up at verse 9 and just do some talking about this. And after these things, I heard a great voice of many people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke went up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true saints of God. The fourth blessing is in verse 9, part B. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's our fourth blessing. And you guys remember the idea of blessing is when it's pronounced upon someone, it means that that individual now is designated to be enlarged, to be expanded, to be caused to grow and to manifest an inpouring of something from outside of them by which now God can be glorified in their life. We made it very clear that when God blesses us, he does not bless us for us. He blesses us for himself. And so he is the ultimate uh, beneficiary of the blessings in our life. Although they bless us, his blessings do bless us. The end result of him blessing us is for his glory. As this particular context, we want to begin to kind of build a composite of understanding why it is that the author says here, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is a blessing in this thing that is a call. And in your outline under the fourth point, I call it the blessing of being what? Called up. Called up. I want to uh, begin to define that concept for you. And we're going to be make, working our way up to it. The idea of being called up is that I believe that this context actually establishes for us the consummation of our journey as believers in the world. And that final call that we get from God to leave this world and to go into the presence of Christ in preparation for what he calls the marriage feast. And so when the language is given, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. The marriage supper of the lamb is a specific event coming in the future for all believers and it's an event that requires us to be called up. And in order to be called up, there are a few other prepositional concepts that we have to work through to get there. And the best way that I can do it, I'm going to do it like this. The, the way to actually benefit and to derive from Revelation 19, 7, all that it's worth, is to actually understand that uh, this is the consummation and celebratory statement of events that began in chapter 18, verse 1. 
when you hear this language, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage feast of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, that is a statement of celebration. It's a statement of consummation. There has been a process of events that have occurred and have transpired that has led to this, this outcry and shout of blessings to them that are called to this event. And I want to see if I can uh, help persuade you of that. I would say this, that there are four fundamental uh, propositions that can be understood starting in chapter 18, verse 1. And that is the call up starts with a call in general. The call that comes in chapter 18, verse 1, that we're working through in Revelation in our Sunday series, uh, is seen in chapter 18, verse 1, this way. And after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And we, we worked through that at length on Sunday, did we not? That what we are dealing with here is the manifestation or revelation of the person of Christ that illuminates a dark world. And in the illumination of that dark world, men and women who once were in darkness now see a great light. So what's taking place in chapter 18 really is a uh, sort of a, a drama of redemption that shows us how Men and women who are in a state of chaos and in a world of struggle, in a world of sin, in fact, in a world of perdition and evil, are brought out of that perdition and evil by the revelation of Jesus Christ, who is here symbolized by the angel. And this happens every time the gospel is preached to men and women who are formerly in darkness. They see the glory of God in Christ. It illuminates them and brings them up out of the darkness of this world in which they are in. And so we begin with what I call the call, the call. In fact, you do know that believers are the what? Called. They are the called. That's how the Bible speaks of us as those who are called. First Corinthians chapter 126 says, you do see your calling, brethren, do you not? How that not many noble and not many mighty and not many wise God has called. That's the language for you see your what's the word calling. And so what I am stating to you is in order for us to hear this call upwards, we first have to hear the call, period. And this call is the gospel call. The gospel itself is a call. The preaching of Christ is a call. Men and women are called by the gospel. We noted that last on Sunday as well. Matthew chapter 20 says many are what? Called and few are chosen. And so I want to uh, establish that idea of the call with you right now in order to uh, bring that home. And this particular call can also be entitled, I'm going to give you four R's, the call that rescues, the call that rescues us. That's what the angel is doing, coming down from heaven into the midst of the dark world. He's illuminating men and women who are in a dark world and would never, ever be able to distinguish what's going on if there was not an illumination. If there wasn't a revelation of Christ in that dark world, well, the dark world and the people in that dark world would just be walking in darkness. And you guys do know that. Prior to him calling us, we were walking in darkness, too. And the darkness was such that we didn't even know we were in darkness. What brought about an awareness that we were in darkness? The gospel. It was a call, a call that illumined and made us aware of our condition and our state in the world that we are in. So you see your calling, brother, not how many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And so the idea of the call speaks to the nature of the preaching of the gospel. Here's a way that it's also put, because that calling of the gospel is designed to call you and I <coughs> Here's the other preposition. We are called, but we are also called out. Called 
out. So there is a calling that comes. The preacher goes forth. He preaches. He proclaims the word of God. And people hear that gospel. They hear that call. Some respond. Some don't. If you're a believer in Christ, you do. And when you hear the gospel call, it is calling you to something. It is calling you out. As you hear the preaching of the word of God, you begin to hear about who God is and how God works and why you need him and what he did in Jesus. And that call, that, that, that voice, that charisma, that trumpet that you heard in the preaching of the word of God now is disturbing you to the point that you are compelled to do something about it. And the most important thing that you're compelled to do is listen more earnestly. When God is calling you by his grace, he's calling you to listen more earnestly. And for a season, what you find yourself doing under the gospel is hearing, hearing, and then you discover that that hearing is starting to move you, move you. It's calling you out. And I'm going to stay in Revelation chapter 18 and underscore this point and then build on it. So the first idea is that the called are the people who are experiencing a what? A rescue. Christ came to rescue us, to deliver us. And it comes through a call. Um, but that call is a call out. Revelation 18, verse 4. Listen to what it says in Revelation 18, 4. This is where I will pick it up uh, to on Sunday as well. Are we there? And I heard another voice from heaven saying what? Come out. Come out. Come out. So the gospel doesn't call you to uh, entertain ideas about God. It doesn't call you to theorize and philosophize about God. The gospel calls you to respond to God and responding to God by faith will move you in a direction away from where you were to where he is. So it's not only a call in that it is an articulate message that has the power of illuminating the world because that's what it does. I love the way Paul put it. When he used that term in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, for God hath caused the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to shine in our hearts and to give us an understanding of who God is in such a radical way that it moved us. It moved us from where we were to where he is. You guys see the language. This is a verse, too, that you want to constantly meditate upon and ask, is it true that the dark world that I was is now illuminated by the light of Christ and so has radically taken hold of my life that I am now able to own that I am also in Christ the light? The light, because that's what we're called, children of light. He says, you are the light of the world. And if that's the case, it means that his light has penetrated my darkness and it has overcome my darkness and it has like now brought me into union with him so that his identity is my identity. And I'm an illuminary. I'm one who is walking in the what? Walking in the light, walking in the light. Why? Because I'm being called. I'm being called and I'm being called out. I love the language. John chapter 10, verse one through four will give us the beautiful, intimate analogy of the efficacy of a shepherd with a sheep. And tell me, is this not what we are experiencing under this call? I'm headed somewhere as we begin to try to work through the idea of the blessed supper of the bride and the lamb. John chapter 10, verse one says, verily, verily, I say unto you, the one that enters in not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. I love what the Lord just said there. You know what he basically said? There are a lot of people and entities that would love to steal the sheep and destroy them for their own means and good. That's how he opens up John chapter 10. He opens up John chapter 10, letting you know that everyone coming to you is not the shepherd. That's how he does it. But now I'm not surprised that he's doing that. Do you know why? Because a faithful shepherd will warn you. He will warn you. Now, notice what he's saying. 
truly, truly, I say unto you, the one that does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. All I need to know now is what is the door? Because if I can identify the door, then I can identify true shepherds. Am I making some sense? Look at verse two. So I'll keep going. He says, but the one that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Aha. If I can identify the door, then this is what I know. The true shepherd of the sheep has access to the sheep through the door. If I see a shepherd climbing up another way or boring a hole under the ground or blasting a hole in the wall or getting in any other way than through the front door, then I know he's a thief and a robber. And I know he's up to no good when it comes to the sheep. But the sheep have to at least know the door, because if you know the door, here's what you know. Your shepherd is going to come through the door to get you. Now, I'm talking to about 10, 12, 15, 20 people in here today. And what I just said went over your head, but it doesn't go over the head of a sheep that's in a sheep pen who actually has a master. Because when sheep are in a sheep pen, all they're ever doing in that sheep pen is waiting for their shepherd to call them. See, and they're not going to actually respond to anybody but their shepherd. And now they've been intelligently advised by the shepherd that when I come, I'm coming through the front door. Don't worry about me climbing over the top. I'm coming through the front door. And so notice what it says in verse three. Here's what it says to him. The porter opens. That is the paid personnel that watches over the sheep pen where all the sheep are. There's a paid personnel that watches over the sheep pen. So the sheep pen is where the sheep are protected and provided for sometimes in temporary journeys overnight where the shepherd is doing business in town and he can take his sheep and put them in a pen. It's a holding place. And in that pen, there are uh, what are called porters who watch for pay so that when the shepherd comes, guess what the porter does? Open up to the shepherd of whom he knows personally and he knows that that shepherd has sheep in that fold. There's a relationship between the porter and the shepherd and the porter is going to open the door to the shepherd to let the shepherd in. This is how the sheep know that the one that's coming is their shepherd. He's coming through the door because he has a relationship with the porter who is the one that opens the door. Y'all got that? Now, again, if we were just dealing with the common literal uh, example of sheep, you guys, we hear about how dumb sheep are, don't we? And we know that to be true on so many personal levels of our own naivete and weakness and capacity for distraction and uh, and mishaps. But on the other hand, sheep are pretty intelligent, too. If you know anything about sheep, they are highly sensitive. If you know anything about sheep, they are very, uh, very um uh, they, they are gregarian. They hang out with other sheep. If you know anything about sheep, they are particular in what they eat and they are particular in the people that they frequent with. And I actually think that's a great analogy of a believer as well, that a believer is careful about what he eats and a believer is careful about who he associates with. And the believer is absolutely committed to sustaining at least an audible ear, if not a visible eye of where their shepherd is. So sheep aren't that dumb. Sheep are smart enough to know that the totality of their care and safety lies in the hand of their shepherd. You got that? And the one thing that sheep are absolutely elated by is when their shepherd calls them, when he calls them. And here is the other concept that I want to get. He calls them out. Notice what the verse says in verse uh, three to him. The porter opens and the sheep hear his what? And he calls his own sheep by name, which means they have a relationship. He's not speaking in general. There is a general gospel call that goes to all human beings. And then there is a particular specific call that goes to God's people in specific, in particular, uniquely and exclusively. And I should not have to ask you, do you know what I mean? Because you should know. 
You should know the uniqueness of being impacted by the word of God and the gospel of his grace that so gripped your heart that you knew that God was talking to you. Also, just by way of application, before I move on to uh, further develop the importance of our analogy, even now for those sheep who are smart enough to stay up under the teaching and preaching of the word of God, you can admit and agree, would you not, of how faithful Christ is to speak to you through the ministry of preaching and teaching, how faithful he is to let you know that he's omniscient, that he's omnipotent, that he is present, that he hasn't left you, that you are not outside of the scope of his reach, that he can talk to you with the most acute and particular and specific language through the preaching and teaching that you know it's the Lord. This is how sheep are. This is how we are. And it's a beautiful thing. And notice again the preposition I want to call your attention to. To him the porter opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own by name and leads them what? Leads them out. So the call is a rescue call and it's a rescue out. Now they are being rescued out of the pen, that holding place. And what are they doing now? They are on a journey. They are on a journey. And that's where all of us are right now. We're on a journey. You're not sitting still. You're not you're not in the pen in this context of providence. You're not in the pen of predestination in this context. You are outside in the field. That's the language that he lays out. He leads them out. Now we are in our journey, traversing the mountains and going through valleys and dealing with resting places and, and riversides as Psalm 23 so clearly lays it out. We are on a journey. You don't feel like you're on a journey? Absolutely, you're on a journey. And so he leads them out. Look at verse four. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. The way you can own that you are a sheep is that you follow Jesus. The way you can own that you're a sheep is that you follow Jesus. So you have been called by the gospel and you have been called out by the gospel. But you also have been I'm getting ready to share with you another thing. You have been called unto something unto something. And let's let's begin to work on that. So the call comes to rescue you. The call has called you out of the pen, but the call has called you unto something, too. I like the way the language is used. We're going to go to. Um, uh, Galatians chapter one, verse six, first Galatians one, six, this is Paul talking to the church at Galatia. And here's what he says to them. Galatians one, six. Um, if we are there, there we go. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that did what called you. So you guys see the analogy of the call. That called you. Now watch what Paul says God has called us unto. That should be translated unto. He has called us unto or into the what? Grace of Christ. You see it? The gospel calls you unto the grace of Christ. That's a worthy pause because the Bible doesn't have empty words. All scripture is pregnant. So the gospel calls you. It calls you out. And it calls you into the grace of Christ. Right. If it's the true gospel, it calls you into the grace of Christ. This is an adumbration. This is an overarching title. The grace of Christ. To what have you been called? The grace of God in Jesus Christ. The content of of the relationship that we have with God is one of grace. The grounds upon which we have that relationship is his son, Jesus Christ. Y'all got that? Grace is the second biggest word in the Bible. The second biggest word in the Bible is grace. The first biggest word in the Bible is Jesus. Don't ever forget it because grace comes through Jesus. Remember what John chapter one says? And of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace. For we have beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. For Moses brought you the law. But what? Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. So watch what the language says. You and I have heard the gospel. The gospel has called us out of darkness and it has called us into the what? Grace of Christ. 
Here's another way that's, that is put, and I love this, is 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, we're going to start at verse 11 and work through verse 14 and listen to the language. Because verse 11 describes the context in which chapter 19, this jubilant chapter, is giving us this, 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 this adoration and consummation of praise that I want to get into here in a few minutes. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 says, And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Now, as a child of God, you already know your position along the lines of this prophecy is that God is actually engaging men and women who are rejecting the gospel, right? He's engaging men and women who are rejecting the gospel with giving them over to their own predilections because they have refused the message of redemption. So he's sending them a strong delusion and that strong delusion we have worked out both in the book of the Revelation and many other passages. Revelation chapter 13 is where we saw the second beast doing signs and wonders, causing fire to come down from heaven, if you will, to make men and women think that he is the true God. And people collapsed up under those false signs and false wonders and ended up receiving the mark of the beast. That's the language we have just come up out of, right? The only reason people would succumb to the mark of the beast is because they are deceived. And the reason they are deceived is because they have rejected the gospel that would shed light on what's going on in this world and lead them out of the darkness that brings them into bondage that will trap them by the delusion that will leave them in captivity to the Babylonian system. And this is what God is saying. He is leaving them there in order that they should what? Believe a lie. All right. So the grace of God is not a lie. Christ is not a lie. The gospel's not a lie. Salvation and redemption is not a lie. But what is a lie is everything that's contrary to it. Everything that's contrary to grace, everything that's contrary to Christ, everything that's contrary to the gospel, and everything that's contrary to the nature of the true and the living God is a lie. And men and women are buying into it. So you don't have to, you don't have to uh, pour into this definition some overtly esoteric meaning. A lie is any and everything that does not correspond with the truth as God has defined it. All right, so you and I are dealing with false narratives every day, are we not? Lies that are pummeling people into obscurity and darkness. And if it wasn't for the grace of God and Christ that called us and then called us out and then called us into the grace that's in Christ, we wouldn't have a plumb line to judge, a flashlight to see, a measuring rod to determine whether what we are hearing is false or true. And I thank God that we do. And so we have dealt with three propositions. One is a verb called. The second one is a preposition, not a proposition, preposition called out, but called unto. Now look at verse 12. Watch this. Verse 12 says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that they might be damned or condemned. That's the better word, condemned. And the idea is if a man or woman has been uh, privileged to hear the gospel and reject that gospel, they are left in a state of condemnation. Right. So the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He that believeth shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. All right. So probably the most criminal thing that we can do on the planet. And there's a lot of criminal stuff we can do in this world. Is to reject God's overture of redemption through Christ. Probably the most heinous thing that men and women will find that they are guilty of on the day of revelation and righteous judgment of God is having rejected the gospel. There probably is no higher criminal offense that a human being can engage in than rejecting what God has done for sinners in the person of Christ. Does that make sense? Right. And, and yet we live in a world today where that's not even a conversation. People everywhere are living in the dignity of their human existence with their own autonomy and their own ideas. And they are shrouded in idolatry on all kinds of levels. And they are blatantly hostile to the gospel and blatantly contrary to Christ. And they feel no sense of liability for it. Do you know why? Verse 11. Deceived. 
They're operating out of a strong delusion. As you know, many, many, many centuries ago, people under the preaching of the gospel struggled with not believing. There were people that would walk around in constant trepidation because they knew they weren't they weren't right with God. There were people who had struggles all their lives. This is one of the things about Pilgrim's progress with the man in the cage. He's caged in his fears, caged in his his doubt, caged in his anxiety because he knew he had heard the gospel for so long and and never submitted to the crown rights of Christ. And now he fears he fears that his heart is too hard. I, I remember 20 years ago having a conversation with a man came into our church and I couldn't understand it because I had never, ever actually labored this arduously with a. Uh, a, a soul that was reflecting upon itself so deeply. He was an Asian man. And he would come in, he would hear the preaching, and he would say, Pastor, how can I know that I'm saved? Because I don't know that I'm saved. And, and then he would explain to me everything he knew. And do you know this man knew a lot? In fact, he knew so much about the gospel. He knew so much about church history. He knew so much about Reformed theology. He knew so much about Luther and about Whitfield and about Knox and about Calvin. And he knew the Pilgrim's progress intimately. And he felt like he was like that man in the cage. I've so sinned against God. I've so rebelled against God. My heart is so hard. I, I, I can't get any assurance that I'm a believer in Christ. That was probably one of the few occasions in my life where I couldn't help that person. That was totally outside of the scope of my ability to help him. Um, there is a place in which men negotiate their fight with God that's outside of the scope of other human beings being able to help them. You need to know that. And all you can do is pray for them. He didn't stay at grace. He left because the preaching of the grace of God was tormenting him because he's, his heart couldn't receive it. Who knows what he had did for all those years? I don't know. I only know this, that that was a very unusual case that left my hands tied in terms of telling him and telling him something. And this this is something that we need to be careful about, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. See that last clause? That is the mystery of iniquity. That's the hook somewhere in the soul of the man or the woman that basically has traded the overtures and the propositions of the gospel. If you understand what I'm saying, somewhere there is a pleasure that they have in the idolatry of their soul that cannot be uh, uh, comprehended or detected or understood by other human beings. Only them, only they know that idol in their soul that forbids them from bowing the knee to Jesus Christ. I don't know that experience. I, I'm thankful that I don't know that experience. I don't know that kind of demonic power trapping me and keeping me from lunging towards Jesus. I don't know what that is. What I do know is the next verse, which is my point, and that's this. But we are bound to give thanks always for you, always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to what? That's the same thing as being called unto the grace of God in Christ. He has chosen you to salvation. Now watch the instrumentality of this choosing. He says he has chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit. See it? In other words, the third person engages the lost sinner, brings them into a relationship with them that's called sanctification, by which the realities of the gospel now take on a real formative experience in their life. It could never happen apart from the spirit of God. You and I are dead in trespasses and sins. Unless the spirit of God takes the call of the gospel and begins to work in your heart and mind, the reality of Jesus Christ in a substantive way, then again, the gospel on a propositional level is merely a theory. Again, with all of the people that I have dealt with over the years, you'll run across people and they will say things and you go, uh-uh, uh-uh, like this. 
Jesus is not a theory. There was a man that used to argue with me over election and predestination and the sovereignty of God and the fact that his free will doesn't have the ability to overthrow God's own prerogative, whether he would save him or not, or whether God would save the world or just save a few. He was wrestling with God, wrestling with me and arguing your theory about Jesus. I said, sir, Jesus is not a theory. And that's your problem. The gospel is just a theory to you. Do you see what I'm getting at? And when it's just a theory, then men argue. When God has shown up in power in your life and he has revealed himself to you in the scriptures and he has changed your heart and he has illumined your understanding and he has raised you from the dead and he has moved you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he has brought you into union with him to where your heart is inclined in its allegiance to Jesus. And you know what it means to be liberated from the bondage of your sin, to be liberated from captivity to slavery to Satan. That's not a theory. That's power. Right? That's power. Like, you can't argue with power. Either the power of the gospel, which is under salvation, has occurred in your life or it hasn't. Right? This is why Paul said, I'm not ashamed to preach the gospel, for it is the power of God. So one of the confidences that we have as preachers is that if we are preaching Christ, the work of the spirit of God can take place. He can take the sinner and sanctify him. That's exactly what is meant in Revelation chapter 18, 4, when it says, come out of her, my people. It's a power that takes you and moves you out of this secular system out of this worldly system, out of the traps and gins and the allurements of this world, out of its mechanisms, out of its practices and out of its traditions, out of its values, out of its assessments. And you know it because you are, you are continually coming out of it. God is continually bringing you out of Babylon. That's a sanctifying process. To be sanctified, sanctified is to be set apart. You guys know that, right? Three dynamics with sanctification. First, God elects you. That's sanctification. He chooses you over against other people. Argue with God about it. I'm so glad he chose me. And then he brings you out. That's another separation. It's, and, and, and you know this too. You, frequently this happens. It doesn't, this is not in common with true believers who, who, who come to know Christ. This is not in, uncommon. Here's how this works. As a rule, you'll be hanging out with people. And, de and then Jesus will tap you on your shoulder and say, all right, it's time to go. That's how that is. You hanging out with all kind of people, then your buddies, your loved ones, your friends, partners. And you swear you, you, you did your ride or die partners until death. Jesus tap you on your shoulder. And then all of a sudden there is a subtle separation. A subtle separation is called sanctification. That's what happened to Paul. That's what he's saying in Galatians chapter one. The Lord called me by his grace and separated me unto the gospel. Well, that's what we're talking about by hearing the call and then being called out and then being called unto. All that is sanctification. Y'all understand that as sanctification. And quite frankly, if we were to go back to the analogy to the sheep, I don't want you to go there. You become more and more comfortable with that process every day of your life. You become more comfortable with your fellowship with your shepherd than you do with anything in the world. Then it makes sense. And you will have to struggle through the memories of all of those folks on the wall of your mind, the pictures of all your partners, all your girls, all up on the wall. He's that struggle. So, yeah, I remember him. I remember them. I ain't seen them in 40 years. I haven't seen them in 30 years. I haven't seen them in 20 years. Pass by them every now and then, holler at them. But the separation is still there. It's, it's in some cases even more imminently because where they are, I am not. Frequently, they are in the past. I'm in the future. And when the past and the future meet, that's not a pleasant conversation. Have you ever had that? Here you are going one way, they're going another way. You meet and all of a sudden they want to take you back 30 years. Sorry. I don't even want to go back that far. 
So I'm doing all I can to be nice and polite, but my head is in another direction. I can't wait till this conversation. I'll call you. I just lied. I have my fingers crossed behind my back. As I walked away, I'm saying, Lord, you know, I just lied. I am not calling him. I am not calling him. Let me see if I can help you. Unless it's my assignment to deal with history, I'm being called forward. Do you understand that? Unless it's my assignment to deal with history. Unless it's your assignment to go back there. And generally that assignment is given to us when we're younger in our walk. Because I did that. I, I went back to all of my hot spots, except the dope house. I couldn't go back to the dope house. I couldn't do that. I don't, I don't know how I could reconcile hanging out with people chopping up heroin and cocaine, trying to preach to them. They would be too blasted to hear it. I wouldn't do that. But I would go back to the hood. I would go back to the streets. I would catch up with my buddies and I would talk to them. And you know what I saw every time? A wall of separation. A spiritual wall of separation. They love me, I love them, but we had two different interests. And it became evident to me that I was being called out. Then he took away the drive. You know, you, Lord, I want to help him. I want to see him saved. And this is where God has to teach you early on that you are bringing to the table too much of your fleshly works. You can't save a dead man. That's his job. Your job is to do what we learned in John chapter 10, verse four. He calls them out, sets them forth, goes ahead of them, and they do what? Follow him. And that's what this is all about, following Jesus. So now one of the things we have to learn how to do with people that get mad at us over the sanctification process, because they will, they'll get mad at you. They'll get, they'll get like, they'll get like chili pepper mad at you. You didn't change. You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to go, thank you. Thank you. Let another man praise you, not your own lips. Thank you. I had a cousin wanted to kill me for changing. I said, brother, we all got to change. He said, no, we don't. I said, yes, we do. If we don't change, we will die. And, uh, and so this is what we're talking about here. Listen to what he says. We're bound to give thanks unto you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit. That's the third person. Now watch this. Belief. What is belief? Faith. Belief is the verbal form of the noun form of faith. Faith is a noun. Belief is a verb. You guys got that? Same Greek term, pestuo pistis. To be a believer is to be a person of faith. So what does the spirit of God do? He sanctifies you by giving you faith. In the what? True. See it? Do you see that? So now watch this. Now I don't want you to go back to the verse, but you can in your own mind. In verse 11, God's sending a strong delusion to all of those who are rejecting the truth. In verse 13, God is giving the third person to everyone that's receiving the truth. And the Holy Ghost is taking that truth and setting you apart by it. The very truth that other people are rejecting is the very truth that's bringing you closer to God in the person of Christ. Am I making some sense? So now watch how it how it consummates. It says you and I have been chosen in the salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Watch this. Verse 14. This is, gets, gets us to my final point on being called, being called out, being called unto. And then the final thing is called up. And I want you guys to capture all of those prepositions because it ends up with you and I leaving this world, being in glory with the one with whom we will enjoy a celestial marriage feast. Where unto he called you by our what? See, he chose you. In the beginning, he set you apart by the spirit. He shut you up to Jesus, who is the truth. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes unto the father but by me. Right. Truth is not merely a proposition. It's a person. Right. I am the truth. God, the father is the truth. The son is the truth. The Holy Ghost is the truth. They are reality. And you and I are being brought into a permanent relationship with that reality by which also we are called to be true witnesses. 
whereunto he hath called you by our gospel to the obtaining, to the obtaining, I want you to get it now, to the obtaining of the what? Glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So right there, everybody's supposed to be running around the room. Right there. Because here is an argument that I'm going to make before I show you the tenor in character of chapter 19. Not going to unpack our verse on blessing. I'm just going to show you the tenor because of our time sake. So he saved you in order to obtain glory. That's what he saved you for. Glory. All right. Paul is not just using words superfluously. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the what? The glory. The doxa. The doxa. In the Hebrew is the chabod. Or the shekinah. He saved you to bring you into the ineffable bliss of his eternal perfections which starts with the analogy of light. Remember, the glory is the light. Y'all better keep up with me. Watch this. All through your Bible, the way God shows up in his glory is as what? Light. 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 Everybody that ever meets God meets him in light. You never meet the true and the living God in a redemptive saving way without it being a revel, a revelation, without it being an illumination, without it being an epiphany, without it being a manifestation. That's what we mean. Before God shows up, we're in darkness. When he shows up, lights get cut on. I don't care if it's by degrees. I don't care if it's by measure. You never, ever experience God in any kind of way that is not revelatory, even in your mind. Like right now, some of you may be having the epiphany. And I hope you are. And if you do, that's the spirit of God. That's what's supposed to happen when the word of God is shared with you. Your mind and your heart and your soul are to expand, making room for that light to bring clarity on. Watch this now. Just tokens. Just tokens of what he made you for, which is glory, which is glory. It's glory. Another synonym, the presence of God. Another synonym, the presence of Christ. Another synonym, heaven. He made you for glory. He made you to obtain it. Obtaining of it. So the call calls us out. It calls us unto. And then it calls us up. I'll give you one more verse. Philippians chapter 3. You can start at verse 12. Philippians 3, 12. And I love the way Paul puts this. And then um, we're almost done for our introduction on the subject. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul is explaining why he is running, why he is following, why he is doing what he does. This is basically an apology to everybody that Paul has left in the dust. You, you know how you sometimes think about, and we just said this a moment ago, that in your journey as a Christian, uh, you are leaving things behind, right? And things meaning people largely. I mean, there are things you leave behind, but things meaning people. And what Paul is explaining, can I tell you why this is happening? Because there's something in front of me that's compelling me towards it that does not give me any time to stop and pause and look back and waste time with people. I'm being compelled by something in front of me. Now, Paul heard the call. Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 27. Did he hear the call? Did he hear the call and did he not see a light? Did that light not knock him down? Did that light not illuminate him? Did that light not now also call him to follow the Lord? And he followed him. He kept following him. And the next thing you know, people were following the Lord because Paul was following the Lord. And that's what he means for us as well. And Paul is on his way to glory. And what he's saying to the folks at Philippi is, don't be mad at me. There's something in front of me compelling me. So if you don't keep up with me, I will either see you in glory 
or I will not. And uh, the best believer you can be, the best believer you can be, child of God, is a believer that leaves a dust trail behind you telling people to keep up. That's the best believer you can be. The best believer you can be is the kind of believer that leaves a dust trail behind you telling people you better keep up because what's in front of me is worthy of all your efforts and labors too. The best kind of believer you can be is the kind of believer that's compelled by something in front of you that is so driving you that it leaves dust behind you and people sense that you are going somewhere, that you are not idle, that you're not stalling, that you're not stagnant, that you're not lost, that you're not wavering, that you're not equivocating. You know where you're going. And the only thing your spirit is saying is, I love you, but you better keep up. And if you don't see me, you can look at my dust trail. That's how you and I should be. This is the best kind of believer you can be. The best kind of believer you can be is let people know that sister, that brother knows where they're going. Because there's a lot of people in the world and very few people you meet know where they're going. It's, it's scary, isn't it? Is it scary? Isn't it scary if we're going to just be honest for a minute before we get into prayer? When you meet people, I'm talking about across the echelon of experience, across the echelons of knowledge. This is so scary. You will meet people who are experts in all kinds of fields and all kinds of vocations. And you will think, surely with that kind of brain, they must know the way to glory. And then they say something as stupid as a rock on the backside of the hills of Mississippi. And you go, he's as lost as a goose in a snowstorm. He got five PhDs and is just as ignorant as can be. He has absolutely no handle or she on eternity. Y'all know what I'm saying? You, you kind of go, whoa, that's crazy. There just is... I mean, like clueless and you're, you're, you're trying to you're trying to hold it together because you know what you're saying? Lord, if it wasn't for your mercy, I'd be there, too. Not many noble, not many wise, not many mighty. Every true believer is a sheep. Having been called, having been called out, having been called unto. And one day called up. Look at the verse. Verse 13. Philippians 3.13. It'll show up one day. The Lord teaches me patience through the PowerPoint. He teaches me. He really does. I fail most of the time, just letting you know. It's very humbling up here. This is verse 13. We'd like to have verse. Uh, OK, here it is. Brother and I. Uh, let me. OK, yeah. Brother and I count myself not to have apprehended. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and what? Reaching forth unto those things which are before. That is a stretching metaphor. It's a stretching metaphor. That's what you should look like in your spirit. Reaching forth. Uh, the analogy is running a race. And sticking your neck out because you want to win it. You know how they do? You know how they do? Right. Because you want to win it. You don't want to tie. You want to win it. And then verse 14. I press. See the language? Now, this is what we're going to pick up on Friday because that's the part that's hard for us to press. Why is it a press, Lord? Why is it so difficult? Why is it such a struggle? But I want you to understand the nature of that sentence is in the active verb form. I'm not being pressed. I press. That was a radical decision on Paul's part to press. It's like a, it's like a resolve to embrace all the obstacles. It's like a choice to accept. All opposition. It's like, it's like, it doesn't matter what's in front of me, I'm pressing. Right? So th this is an attitude thing. And it's actually the kind of attitude every believer has to have. Like, Jesus used the language in Matthew's 
chapter uh, 12, when he says the kingdom suffered violence. And the violent take it by force. And he's using the analogy that pressing into the kingdom requires embracing suffering. And that you meet suffering with a passion to have Christ to mitigate that suffering from what it's designed to do by the enemy. And that is to cause you to lose momentum. To cause you to stagger. To cause you to equivocate, to cause you to slow down, to cause you to halt. Jesus says the violent take it by force. That's the attitude that I was setting forth for you. And Paul was a perfect example of it, wasn't he? Notice what he says. I press toward the mark for the prize. And here's our last preposition of the what kind of calling? Upward calling. So here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. He's saying the gospel has called me. It's called me out. It's called me unto the grace of God in Christ. It's sanctifying me. And it's calling me unto. And one day it's going to call me up. And I want to finish in a way that when that upward call comes, my name is on the list. My name is on the list. That's what he's saying. And that's what you're hearing in Revelation chapter uh, 19. So I want to go back there, read it again, and close. And we're going to pick it up. So much to unpack in that blessing. I gave you the earthly journey. Friday, we're going to, I'm going to take you to the heavenly journey. Because it starts in chapter 18, makes its way to chapter 19. Chapter 19 is a consummation chapter. All the struggle is over with. The city is burned up. The whore is burned up. The saints have died. The, ba the battle is, is, is done now. And, you, and it opens up in chapter 19, verse 1 this way. I'm, I'm going to give you what I intentionally did not give you when I read it the first time. I'm going to read all the way up to verse 8 and done. And after these things, after what? You know, the burning up of the city, the destruction of Babylon. The end of the opposition, the end of that world system that opposes God with everything that's in it from from the basic rudiments of sociological trends all the way up to the highest technology in the world that is used against the one true and the living God. All of it comes crumbling down. And chapter 19 opens up with some folks happy about it. Happy about it. Do y'all see what I'm saying now? Happy about it. I'm going to show you on Sunday the ambivalence of people who see the Babylonian system shaking and they somehow want to prop it up. They want to save it. And sadly, we're going to discover that many of them are professing Christians that want to save the thing that God is saying that's going to come down. And in chapter 19, you got heavenly minded folks saying, hallelujah. Do you see it? In verses one through six. You will hear a word used that you never read in the New Testament. Do you know what that word is? Hallelujah. Do you see it? Hallelujah. After these things, I heard a great voice of many people. Lord, I want that to be me. I want to be among those people saying hallelujah. And it's actually hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Look at verse 2. For true and righteous are your judgments, for he hath judged the great whore. He's, they're singing a praise unto God about judging the whore. You see what I mean by value systems? Ye who love the Lord hate evil. They're actually singing songs about the destruction of the whore. And they're singing songs of praise to God in the highest level of expression. Look at it. Which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Verse 3. And again they said what? Hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Do you see the juxtaposition of the joy? Over against the demise. Do y'all see that? Do you see a group of people rejoicing while Babylon is smoldering? Do you see it? 
Notice what it says. Alleluia. Her smoke rose up forever and ever. You know, these are people who have been made to be perfectly compatible with the righteous mind of God. Do you get that? They don't have a scintilla of sinfulness in them by which they would have a misguided value system of wanting to feel sorry for God's justice against this world. Watch the next verse. Here it is. Keep it moving. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying what? Amen. Alleluia. There it is again. You got all kind of folks in heaven just busting out in absolute jubilation over the end of Babylon. That's important then, isn't it? The end of Babylon is important in heaven, is it not? Like super important. Look at verse five. And a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God. Do you know what we call that? We call that an exegetical. It's an interpretation of the word what? Alleluia. Because Hallel is the Hebrew term for praise. Yah is the term for Jehovah. Praise Jehovah. That's what you're saying whenever you say hallelujah. And I love this because we're, we're country bumpkins. We don't know what hallelujah means. And so the writer said, you know, they're going to be reading their Bible in, uh, in the year 2020. I think it's going to be December 1st and they're going to be reading Revelation 19. And they're going to even know what hallelujah means. Let me just write the, an interpretation in there for them. Praise our God, all ye his servants and ye that fear him, both great and small. And here it is one more time. Watch this. Verse six. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent. What? There it is. We got a lot of theology to learn in these six verses about true worship. We got a lot of theology to learn. We're going to unpack that more fully on Friday. I'm just scratching the surface. You see, in heaven, their theology is right and their praise is pure. Their, 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 their theology is right. Their praise is pure. Nothing humanistic about this. Nothing syrupy about this. Nothing emotional about this. If this is not God centered, I don't know what God centered is. Now watch as it leads up to the what I call the consummation statement. Verse seven. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is what? And his wife had what? Made herself ready. That's advised language that we want to work through on Friday because that's a very clear interpretation. No one makes her ready. She makes herself ready. She literally has engaged in what was necessary so that when the call comes, she's what? Ready. 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 And I can take you back to the parable of the ten virgins and going to sleep and some folks being ready and some folks not being ready. And this is the beautiful intimation inferred in this text with all the hell going on in the world, with the Babylonian system encroaching upon us, wanting to collapse on top of us, wanting us to believe that it's going to win. But we know better because we see the rainbow through the cloud, because we've heard the word of God, because we know we have the victory in Jesus. The believer continues the process of getting what? Ready. It doesn't matter what's going on, you keep getting ready. It doesn't matter what's going on, you keep getting ready. Because you never know when you're going to hear the call. Here it is. Let us be glad. See, I, he, they teach me patience. They teach me patience. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Give honor to him. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Take your notes because I'm going to tell you when we unpack that on Friday, there's a lot of people that will not be rejoicing and the believer has to rejoice. How do you rejoice unless you have a proper vision of what God is up to, particularly in the midst of crazy? Like in the midst of crazy, what the enemy wants you to see is him. What God wants you to see is him. And when you see God, you can rejoice because you know he's on his throne. The Lord God omnipotent is what? Reigning. Hallelujah. God's having his way. What if right now the angel told you right now at this moment with everything that's going on? Are you ready? God's having his way. 
Like nothing is out of control, right? Like, like right now, nothing is out of control. Everything is exactly and precisely like God wants it. Are you happy about it? Or is your value system so jacked up that you can't see that God is doing what he's doing because he has a plan beyond all this for his people and for his glory. Now, all he wants us to do is keep getting prepared for it. See what I'm getting at? Here it is. Watch this. I'm, I'm almost done. She hath made herself ready. I can't wait to talk about that. Verse eight. Here it is. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. This girl going to be sharp, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. I want to unpack that so we won't be stupid about it. And here's the blessing. This is the blessing. Look at the next verse. This is the blessing. This is where we started. And he said unto me, write this, John, write this down, John, write this down. Blessed are everyone who is what? Called to the supper. Called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, that's when the heavens going to bust open. Just letting you know. And that last trumpet's going to sound. Just letting you know. And all of the bride of Christ is going to take her flight up. Just letting you know, that's when that's going to happen. And either we're going to be ready or we're not. All right, we're getting ready to pray. We're going to take a few minutes, shut it down. Y'all know what to do out there. Um, I hope that encouraged you. We need to come back and deal with that blessing on Friday because there's a lot there.